uh, closing arguments today in the Ahmaud Arbery case, folks. And racism was just up front as the attorneys, as the white attorneys for the three white men on trial for killing Arbery, for lynching him, just said some of the most heinous, despicable things in an effort uh, to get the jury uh, to agree with them to find them not guilty. For, listen, just listen to this. Travis is thinking about Ahmaud Arbery. He's thinking about what must be in his mind in order for himself to try to figure some things out. Travis knows that he caught Ahmad going into the house. He knows that. And so Ahmad should know that Travis knows that. He knows that Ahmad has been down on the dock and that Ahmad should know he's been down on the dock, that he's been on someone else's property. He's got to know that by now, Travis is thinking. He knows it's not his home or his house under construction. He knows that he's been caught sneaking around the bushes. Travis is the one that caught him. He knows that there's been a confrontation about that. He knows, he believes Mr. Arbery's got to be, this guy, this, this, this man has to understand that these things have taken place, that he had headlights on him, that, that, that somebody was trying to talk to him about why he was out after dark in front of this house, and he didn't respond. If I say to, to one of you, hey, how are you doing? And you just look at me and you walk away. You know you've looked at me and walked away. You know that. Turning Ahmad Arbery into a victim after the choices that he made does not reflect the reality of what brought Ahmad Arbery to Satilla Shores in his khaki shorts with no socks to cover his long, Dirty toenails. Toenails. She actually said his dirty toenails. My pal, Dr. Julian Malvo, Dean, College of Ethnic Studies, California State University, Los Angeles, Amisha Cross, political analyst, Democratic strategist, Dr. Omakongo Dabinga, professorial lecturer, School of International Service, American University. Uh, Amisha, I want to start with you. Uh, it is, I mean, to one, to blame Ahmad for him being murdered, for him being lynched, when the homeowner who owned that home testified nothing was stolen. When these three racists testified that, yeah, they didn't see him take anything, they made all kinds of assumptions. But for her to stand there and his dirty toenails, that is beyond despicable. Whew, you're right. This defense got desperate a long time ago. Um, the, 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 the state put a very strong case against them in their closing arguments earlier today and outlined just why this would never fly as not only any form of self-defense, but also not even um, any form of real citizen's arrest. So what we see here is a woman who did what white supremacists do best. Um, she leaned back on white fear. She leaned back on the fact that there are several people across multiple states, several white people across multiple states, who do not want black people in their neighborhoods, who are, you know, if something goes missing or if something goes wrong or they fear that their community has changed in any type of way, that automatically there is a black person to blame. She fell on all of that, even though there is no evidence to present any amount of guilt for, guilt for Ahmaud Arbery at all. We hear about dirty toenails in a case where the people who she's trying to protect are murderers who literally attacked a young man in broad open daylight who had no weapon, who was in retreat, who did not know them from Adam, who had every right to run along the side of the street anywhere in America he chooses to run. Um, this It was just really frustrating to watch, especially in the closing argument. This is the moment in which you're supposed to make the best case you can for the last thoughts of the jury before they go back and they make their decision. I think that because of the desperation that this defense feels at this point, they're leaning back on the one thing they know and that we've seen from some of the residents from Satilla Shores who have set on, um, set on the witness stand at this point, there are some innate racist thoughts within these individuals. And I think that because this is a jury of the McMichaels peers, 
be mindful. This is a jury of the McMichael's peers. This is not a jury of Ahmaud Arbery's peers. There happens to be an idea that if she can at least place one seed of fear of just a black man being there, being in a neighborhood that she doesn't believe that he should have been a part of at all, then that's enough for them to either lessen the sentence or not convict at all. Um, Julian prosecutor Linda uh, Dunikowski really laid it out and made it very plain for the jury uh, in her closing arguments. Listen. So what are you going to hear? I don't know. What, I don't know what they're going to say. They're good. They're good defense attorneys. They're going to get up here, and I'm. The state is so worried that they're going to make it seem so reasonable that everything that Travis did and Greg did is just so reasonable. I'm just ask you, use your common sense and put your thinking caps on. But this is what I anticipate, or what we anticipate they're going to say. The victim started it, or you're going to hear that he was the aggressor, okay, because he was running towards Travis McMichael, but he was running away from Mr. Bryan, who had already tried to hit him with the pickup truck, and Greg McMichael said it. He was trapped like a rat. He knew there was nowhere else to go. You know? Or they're going to tell you that, ladies and gentlemen, this is really about the front of the pickup truck. Forget everything else. It was all about the front of the pickup truck. And they're going to try and make it seem like, well, he attacked Travis McMichael. He very well might have. We can't see. What we know is his hand was like this, right? Doesn't matter. You know why it doesn't matter? Because they weren't committing a citizen's arrest. They weren't in fear, real fear, of imminent danger from Mr. Arbery. They weren't committing the four felonies. That's what they were doing. You're going to hear, we weren't committing felonies. We were doing a citizen's arrest. We weren't trying to provoke him into defending himself. You're probably going to hear this. Yes, we pointed a shotgun at him to get him to comply with our orders. Not sure why anyone should comply with their orders. To stop and talk to us, but there was no reason for him to defend himself against us. Because this was a citizen's arrest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the bottom line. As I said in opening, I'm going to say it to you again. This was an attack on the Mall Arbery. They committed the crimes. They committed the four felonies. They attacked him. They shot and killed him. They can't claim self-defense under the law because they were the initial unjustified aggressors and they started this. And they were committing the felonies against Ahmaud Arbery. They have to somehow justify their actions by claiming citizen's arrest. I'm gonna remind you once again, evidence from the witness stand, they never ever said on February 23rd, 2020, that they were doing a citizen's arrest or trying to arrest him. It was all, we wanted to stop, we wanted to question him about what he was doing because he must have committed a crime that day and we were going to hold him so the police could go back and figure out what crime it was that he must have committed as he was running down the street. Julian, she nailed it. She did. She did a really good job of laying it out. She called them on them using the race card every chance they could get. I mean, I'm still outraged when... One of them got up and said, how many pastors do they have? Well, the answer is as many as you want to have. I mean, what they underestimate is the connection in the black community. But even more than that, she was extraordinarily thorough. She, she put it out there. She used their words against them. And they seemed the, their defense attorney was silly. How did she know his toenails were dirty? Was she up on them? Did she go to the autopsy? Come on. What these people are doing is pandering to every racist stereotype that exists. And they're doing it because this is a climate in which we live. I mean, it's hard to watch the news. It's hard to basically inculcate the space we're in. I was talking to a friend yesterday and she, she was crying about this, crying, because she has young male sons, um, as I have young male nephews and godchildren, godsons, who it's like this could happen to anybody. And l years, years ago, um, Richard Wright talked about the way the black community is connected so that a lynching, he said, in one city had reverberations everywhere. And that's what we're seeing again. The black community is outraged, is stunned, is hurt. But we have been reminded yet again that white supremacy is the law of the land. Omicongo. 
I, I got to say, Roland, you know, you, you send the, the, the prep articles, you know, for us, to be, you know, and everything what we're going to talk about. I see this stuff trending on Twitter. And, you know, but this is actually the first time I actually heard the part about the toenails. I, I hearing it and it, 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 it hit me dead in my tracks, man. You got the parents sitting there watching this trial, watching their son be dehumanized every day. And then you go that low. So we understand the whole thing about have you no shame. We know that I have no shame. But the fact of the matter is when all else fails, lean on white supremacy, lean on white hatred towards black people, lean on white dehumanization. This is really tragic. And to be quite honest, in any other situation, when you remove whiteness from it, we would all say, this is a slam dunk case. How could somebody do this? We have to be re re remember that this case, what happened to Arbery, is the reason why they got rid of the citizens' arrest laws in Georgia, which are also rooted in slavery, which are also rooted in the times where we didn't have a police force, and these guys were deputized to go and get people who were free. And so this is rooted in slavery, and so we're coming up to a lynching in 2021, and they're using the same tactics, and if they get over with this one, this is 10 times worse than the Rittenhouse case. And we all know the reasons why, because this is going to give people a reason to believe that they can go out and do this type of act, do this type of ignorance, and get away with it. But just those comments, it's a travesty, and it's just completely disrespectful to that family and to our community, just going off of Richard Wright's quote that Dr. Mavro just shared. We all felt that. Back to my uncle's video in just one moment. Once upon a time, there lived a princess with really long hair who was waiting for a prince to come save her. But really, who has time for that? Let's go. Feeling myself. I'm feeling myself. She ordered herself a ladder with Prime One Day Delivery, and she was out of there. I want some hood girls looking back at it and a good girl in my tech break. Now, her hairdressing empire is killing it. And the prince, well, who cares? Prime changes everything. Time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I gotta defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black, I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig?